Hello, my name is Sheila and I would like to welcome you to my podcast All About You. I love to listen to podcasts and especially conversations with famous people. However, I think everyone has a story to tell. Maybe a place you have visited, a hobby you enjoy or anything that you feel would be of interest. I want to have conversations with lots of different people and hear their stories. So if you have a story to tell, please contact me on my email allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com. Welcome to another conversation on the All About You podcast. I have to admit, I'm more than a little nervous today as I have a very special guest for you. It's someone I have followed for many years on all things financial, and he is a superstar in the world of everyday finance. Not only is he a chartered financial planner and managing director of his business, Jackson's Wealth Management in Penzance, UK, He also has the very successful podcast, Meaningful Money, with over 350 episodes. A YouTube channel with over 500 videos on all different aspects of finance. And in his spare time, he has written the Meaningful Money Handbook, which guides you through the different life stages in respect of your money. So he really knows his stuff. However, as a teenager, he freely admits he was not the best with money, so he's come a long way. So, Pete Matthew, welcome to the All About You podcast. Oh, that was really lovely, Sheila. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> I'm, a li- I'm a little bit uh, uncomfortable with the word superstar, but I'll, but you know, I'll take it. It's, no, it's you're a superstar in my eyes. You're one Bless of my you. icons, and and I'm very very nervous. Well, you're very kind. You've been a really warm supporter, and we've corresponded many times over the years, haven't we? And uh, I'm yeah, really great. We've really, known each other a long time. Yeah, yeah, really grateful for that. So it's great to be here, mate. Thank you. So, Pete, I'd like to welcome you to the podcast, and I particularly wanted you to do this topic: financial education for children, because. You are a father and you are a financial educator. And I feel very strongly that financial education for children is so important. And the way I see things today is that children only ever see pieces of plastic being given over for goods and services. Back in our day, we were a similar age, we saw pound shillings and pence, we saw actual transactions of money. I I had pocket money as a child. And I just wonder how children view the world of money when they don't actually see any any transactions with cash. I wanted you to explain, and one of the mantras you have with your financial education, teach people everything you need to know and everything you need to do. You're right. It's a changing world. I think the first thing we need to accept is that it's not going to go back anytime soon. And I'm sure eventually a cashless society will be upon us, as much as that might strike many of us with fear and dread. Uh, it's, I think it's probably inevitable. You know, it's probably only a matter of time before we have kind of digital tattoos or something that we can just scan and who knows, right? Um, and so it requires a different way of working i think a different way of teaching our kids how to navigate that world and essentially transactions still happen of course they they're just like below the surface because you know a piece of plastic you tap on the thing comes back with you in you know it stays in your hand doesn't it it goes back in your sort of purse or your wallet or whatever so well you know what's happened there no nobody's like taken a, a chunk out of it or like they used to do with bus tickets back in the day nobody's done that you know and so we need to learn how to navigate the system, but we also need to give our kids some credit for the fact that they are growing up as digital natives. So they also um, have, well, they live in a world which is totally different to ours and they're growing up in a world which is totally different to ours. And so they will understand things like, you know, points and credits in video games and things like that. And the fact that you can lose those things or you can spend those things to power up or whatever in video games. So there's an element of that as well. So it's going to require a totally different uh, way of working. I don't think there will ever be any kind of substitute though for 
being intentional about how we teach our, kid, our kids. You know, that's one of my favorite words, right? If we, we, we can sort of drift uh, through life and just kind of hope that everything will be okay, or we can s- sort of sit down and say, right, how am I going to teach my kids about money? How am I going to give them a healthy relationship with it? It's more than just the mechanics. It's more than just the transactions. It's how can we have a healthy relationship with money, keep it in its place as a tool, as opposed to it being a god, you know, something we pursue and worship and sort of, you know, uh, chase after uh, to, uh, you know, an unhealthy degree. So we need to, um, you know, help our kids observe us. I think kids watch and observe and take things in at an incredible rate. And they're less likely to just, you know, if you just sit, sit them down in a chair and stand in front of them with a whiteboard and lecture them, they're not going to take it in, right? It, it needs to be, you know, as we make our own transactions, as we sit down and do our budget, things like that. Um, you know, it needs to be collaborative and it needs to be uh, enveloping, if you like. You come along with me as I show you how this stuff works. But it's um, definitely some challenges for sure. I think looking back at my own financial education, when I was very young, I had pocket money and I was taught that, yes, you can spend it all in one go. You can save some and you can spend some or you can spend it all or save it all and you'll have double the next week. So from a very young age, I learned about pocket money and helping around the house if I wanted something a bit bigger, okay, this is the price of it, you need to earn this, and every chore was given a value. Right. So I learned about earning money. Yeah. Um, as, as a teenager, when I first started work, my first pay packet was 29 pounds. Mm-hmm. And I remember my mum saying, when you get their first pay packet, try and spend it on one item and spend all that money. She said it will be the only time in your life when you get to spend your week's wages on an item. And I remember I went to Marks and Spencers. I bought a black corduroy jacket, and I think it was something like £25. I thought I had conquered the world. Amazing. Great advice, though. What a great lesson. Absolutely. And then I remember, I think probably 16, 17, my dad took me to the bank. We met with the bank manager, as you did in the day. You met with him. You opened up a bank account. My dad put £100 into the bank account, got the checkbook. He said, right, okay, we've got you set now. And I have to say, through those lessons, I've never had any worries about money. I've never been overdrawn. I've never had problems with credit cards. And I put all of that education purely with thanks to my parents who set me on a good road from a very young age. That's, I mean, that's so valuable, isn't it? I had kind of the opposite. I didn't have much of a financial education at all, even though my mum and dad were very careful and very good with their own money. It was a kind of a taboo subject. So my abiding memory of any conversation about money or any attempted conversation about money with my dad, who largely handled the finances, was a very quick response from him, which was, that's none of your business, son. So I'd say, you know, how much did, how much did the car cost, dad? Or, you know, uh, how much do you earn or something like that? And he's like, that's none of your business, son. He said, like, well, it, it wasn't any of my business, but that's not really the way to uh, soothe an inquiring mind and actually help. You know, that would have been an opportunity, uh, I would have thought, but evidently not. I mean, I had a idyllic childhood in many ways, so I don't blame mom and dad for that. It's just it wasn't something that they were good at and something I've been determined to put right. So, you know, as you rightly mentioned, I'm a father to two girls. I now have no children, though. They're both adults. They're 21 and 18. So, you know, they get more expensive as they as they grow up, I think. But, um, you know, I've tried to include them to answer their questions. So if we're sitting down doing the budget or whatever, they might, or I'm reconciling bank accounts, you know, they might come around behind me and ask, what are you doing, Dad? And I'd show them and so, okay, this is what's coming in this month, and we've got all these bills here, so we need to make sure those are paid, and then what we've got left is what we can spend on. And, you know, we're going on holiday next month, so we need to make sure we keep some spending money for that. And just talk them through it, and they pretty quickly lose interest, but, you know, it, it's just reinforcing the fact that money is something that needs to be managed, I think. It's not something to be afraid of. Got to be really careful with language around money around kids, particularly when they're very young. 
uh, money is a source of anxiety, obviously, for lots of uh, lots of us. And you've got to be careful not to project that onto kids. We can do untold damage, you know, uh, in in doing so. I think in the way, in the language that we use around it, um, got to be careful uh, not to elevate it to a position that it that it shouldn't have. Uh, I think. But just bringing the kids alongside and what letting them observe what we're doing not being afraid of doing that. So you learned good lessons. I had to teach myself and I was a really rubbish teacher. So, you know, I, one of my abiding memories when I was a paper round, right? I was a paper boy. And I seem to remember my wages were £3.90 a week. This is sort of 1987, something like that. And the paper shop was on my route to school. So I used to walk past it every morning to school. And the proprietor of the paper shop would allow us to pre-spend our wages, right? So he kept a tally. So I could go in there, buy 50p worth of sweets, and instead of getting £3.90 at the end of the week, I get £3.40, right? And essentially, that's a payday loan, right? Now, it was interest-free, but I would frequently get to the end of the week and be given like 27p in wages because that's all I had left. I'd pre-spent it all. Terrible, terrible lesson to teach kids, really. If I ever uh, meet Mr. Schofield, who was the proprietor, I shall have words with him because, uh, uh, you know, I don't think he did me any favors, but I also take full responsibility for the fact that I was terrible with money. And that just continued. When I went to university, It was I was given two credit cards with a £250 limit on each of them without any instruction as to the dangers of those or the high interest rates or anything like that. From my point of view, it's just like, well, this is cool. <laughs> this is free money, isn't it? And of course it wasn't. I had to write to my bank manager several times when I was a student to explain the overdraft. And, you know, I was determined that my kids wouldn't do that. And my eldest now finished university and she's, you know, done that with a credit balance. So we've helped her a little bit, but she's also worked and she's managed her own money. So, you know, if you have great lessons, that's, that's fantastic. That's a real gift, actually. Uh, I had to find my own way. I made a whole bunch of mistakes. Mercifully married a woman who was very good at managing her own money. Uh, and then I got into this industry, so I kind of had to wise up <laughs> and then learn how it worked. You know, it would have been a bit, um, well, it would have been wrong for me to, you know, help clients with their finances while my own were in disarray. And in fact, actually, we have to be whiter than white. We can't have any credit strikes or anything like that in order to do what I do. So great. There's such powerful lessons can either be learned or not learned. And we've got to be really deliberate about that. And as far as the mechanisms are doing for that, that concern, I imagine we'll, we'll get on to that. I, I think it would be very interesting if you did meet the owner of that paper shop again to say, well, okay, you know, we created the very first payday loan, but look where I am now. You know, <laughs> if they could see me now as the song goes, yeah. It's a long yeah. time ago, Sheila, it's a long time ago. <laughs> but the interesting thing, though, is I am so grateful for the education my parents gave me from such a young age when I was in the pocket money phase, the first wage packet phase, getting the bank account, they, you know, they just did a brilliant, brilliant job. And although they are no longer with me, I, I have never, ever been overdrawn in my bank account. I've never had problem with credit cards. And that is all down to the education I had. Yeah, but I bet you didn't get anything from school, did you? No. No. That's still largely the case now. And so it's, so that's a lottery then, isn't it? If we have parents who give us good lessons, all the better. If we don't, then you're pretty much on your own. And there is no concerted sort of financial education as part of the curriculum at any point, not really. I think that is slowly changing, but not quick enough. And I think particularly at sort of tertiary level, I think it would be super important. That's when we need to get really granular about how it actually works and the dangers of debts. So, you know, 16 to 18, when they're well, certainly here in the UK, obviously, they're, that's mandatory education up until 18. So at that point, they're either going to go to uni or they're going to go into the world of work and will have to properly manage their finances. And usually around about that time, they're getting Saturday jobs or weekend jobs or whatever. So we really need to, I think, take, make the most of that time but also put in some stuff to sort of lay the groundwork and some foundations up to that time as well. Because, I mean, my eldest is 21. She's, um, she's got work. It's not a job as such. She's self-employed as a consultant for a, what's called a blue economy consultancy, so anything to do with the economy in the ocean, basically. 
And so she's self-employed and there is a chance that they might retain her. So she'll have like a regular income, but she's self-employed. That means she's responsible for her tax, national insurance, pension saving and stuff like that. And so I'm saying to her, look, you, you need to put around uh, aside at least a third, really. Put aside a third of what they're going to pay you. That'll be enough then to pay your tax and NI, make a decent pension contribution. So keep aside a third and then two thirds, you know, you can save a little bit and, and enjoy the, most of it, you know. And she said, how would I know about national insurance and tax if, if you hadn't told me? I said, well, exactly. You, you know, you have to sort of think, should I be doing something? And maybe look at the gov.uk website or whatever, you know, and learn about income tax and think, well, okay. But who's going to do that? You know, most people will do that when they when it's too late and they get a tax bill. And yes. they think, well, hell, what do I do now? I go into my overdraft or I borrow it. Or... The financial education system is letting us our kids down, no question. So that needs addressing. That's much bigger than you or I can get involved with, you know. So, you know, I'm fortunate, you know, I've had kids, so I've been, I've been able to pass on my little bit to them. But, you know, there the definitely needs to be a more concerted, uh, concerted holistic effort, I think, uh, on, on the part of governments. Sure. I mean, I remember when I first started work and the first time I worked for a company and I was offered um, to be part of the company's share option scheme where you could buy shares in the company. And, of course, you would buy the shares before tax, so yeah, yeah. you would pay less for them. And I remember going home to my dad and saying, right, you know, the company have offered this. He said, Sheila... If ever you get the opportunity to buy shares in a company, and I've you know I've worked for blue chip companies during over the years, buy them. Mm -hmm. He said because generally you're going to get them at a lower price than if you were buying them outside. Mm -hmm. And I've still got them, and you know this is over decades, and they are doing very nicely. Thank you. I mean I'm not sure whether they're earmarked for trip to Acapulco or what. I mean not quite that. Maybe. Uh, maybe a couple of easy debt trips but that piece of advice alone was whenever you get the option then op often you can buy them on a monthly basis or you can buy a chunk so for example great advice yeah oh brilliant advice yeah and, you know we don't have to worry too much about the mechanics not when they're very young obviously you know we, we don't need to lecture our kids on you know ISAs versus VCTs or, or the complexities of that sort of stuff it's just like you know, putting some aside for tax, putting up, paying yourself first. It's the big principle. So make sure you save first because if you just try and save what's left at the end of the month, there'll never be anything left at the end of the month. So pay yourself first to determine, you know, how much you are going to save and do that before everything else. You know, avoid debt where possible, particularly bad debt, which is high interest uh, and used to buy stuff that goes down in value. So, you know, if you can avoid bad car loans, which are usually far too expensive, or, you know, don't buy a TV on a credit card. Don't get sucking into store cards just for the 10% off the first you know, first buy because they're ridiculously expensive. Because all that stuff can be a slippery slope. There's a very worrying trend currently with buy now, pay later schemes, uh, which I'm concerned about because you've got a lot of these influencers, uh, you know, sort of pimping them to their followers and it's not uh, not a good trend at all, really, where, you know, these people who have no idea about finance are, you know, and who are doing very nicely, thank you, for, because of their, you know, sculpted bodies on Instagram, and they're using those to sort of, to push bad financial habits on our kids, which I think is a very worrying trend and needs regulating, um, I think, certainly more, uh, more strongly than it is currently. You know, it's easy to be negative about this, but there's actually, I think we can all decide to, to take a positive approach to it, particularly if we've got kids. It's like, okay, we know this needs to be done. And actually, it's probably, do you know, it's probably one of the best gifts you can give to your kids. I mean, you've already said, Shirley, your, your really good experience of having positive lessons. I'm fortunate that I ended up on the straight and narrow, more by hook and by crook, and, uh, you know, marrying a good woman, really, who put me straight. But if, we, if we've got kids, or if we're responsible for teaching them, perhaps, we can say, right, yeah, how are we going to equip them in the best way? So I have some views on how to do that. Which should we? Uh, shall I sort of uh, go into those, or you? Do you want to? Uh, no, no, no. Please, please do it. Let's get on to everything you need to do. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, we mentioned earlier, but I think it's worth just reinforcing the fact that the language we use around money is really important. Even though kids learn by observation and they learn by doing, 
they also pick up how we speak. So we need to set a healthy tone for money in our in our homes. So it's very easy to talk about, well, you know, maybe we'll win the lottery one day and everything will be okay. That's a terrible message to send because, you know, you're more likely to be struck by lightning twice in the same year than you are to win the lottery. So, you know, it's probably not a great hope to hold out. If money is really tight, you, you know, as it is for all of us at some point, then work together as a family. What changes are we going to make? And, and uh, talk in positive terms, you know, if we stick to a budget, we're going to have a reward night. We'll watch a DVD and we'll get some popcorn or whatever. And make it almost try to gamify it, really, rather than say, oh, God, this is what, you know, we've really got to sort of tighten our belts and, you know, we've got to have Tesco value cornflakes instead of crunchy nut or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. You, you do, try to be positive about it and, and set up for wins in that. Talk about saving up for a holiday. Uh, and you can even, I don't know, like put a, you know, like a church roof type thermometer thing. Yeah. They, used, they used to have, you know, we're sort of, we're, we're working our way up or, uh, you know, you can do grids where you color in a square for uh, progress towards saving up for a holiday, say. So we need a thousand pounds for a holiday. We're going to save away. And, we, you know, we have a sort of chart as to how we're doing. So it kind of gamifies it. It involves the kids, uh, which I think is really important. And obviously, you'll enjoy the holiday a lot more than if you just stick it all on a credit card. And instead, when you come back from your holiday, you've got the, the bill and the angst that comes with that. Um, I think it's important, even though money is now largely virtual, there are some uh, good tools to help teach them about that. So both my girls had GoHenry uh, cards. So it's basically a prepaid Visa debit. So they can use it you know, in, in shops. They can even use it online. Um, I did uh, read somewhere, it's probably might well be out of date, but I read somewhere that kids start to buy things online from about age 10 on average. You hear these stories of, of kids finding their dad's credit card <laughs> and just running amok of whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So a prepaid card like a GoHenry and there's, there's other ones available, you, you know, is a good way because obviously they can't go into overdraft. It's not a credit card and you can reward them for chores and things like that. So they can have, um, I mean, both of my girls helped clean the office here for quite a few years and they would be paid regularly. The pay would come to our bank account and we would send it to them in weekly dribs and drabs onto their GoHenry card. And then on every Saturday morning, they would have a little notification on their phone because they live on their phones um, to say, you know, another eight pounds has gone onto your Go Henry card or whatever. And so they see the money coming in. And then when they spend it, they get another notification. They see the money going out. And they've got the app there. They can see where it is. So we can use these tools. I think that's really valuable. And a lot of these uh, also have the capacity to have separate pots. And so we can have conversations with our kids and say, right, okay, you have earned 10 pounds for doing this job. How much are you going to spend? How much are you going to save? And if you know if you want to, how much are you going to give away? You know, it's a useful lesson to teach kids early on as well. How much are you going to spend? How much are you going to save? How much are you going to give? And there's no reason why that can't be virtual or or actually physical. But I think these days it's increasingly going to be virtual. And it's like let's open up the app, and we've got a giving pot, we've got a saving pot, and we've got a spending account. So you know how we're we going to divvy it up. Um, both my girls have really benefited from that. And have a real, they have a sort of deep seated, deep seated aversion to spending their savings. Now, you, you know, it's like I don't want to, I don't spend that money. That's my long term pot. I don't actually know what it's for yet, but I know I'm going to need it in the future. <laughs> so, you know, I, and that's that's great. I'm glad they're that way rather than just ah oh, well, let's just live for today and spend it. So I think you know, th there's some tools uh, there. Watching our language, including them in your own money management. I think is a really good idea just so that they can see that it's a normal part of adult life and it's just something that doesn't need to be full of angst, doesn't need to be a, something you dread, but something which actually, if you keep on top of it, doesn't take very long. I think there's, there's merit in, I would say writing things down, but actually, again, that's mostly in the app, but actually just sitting, if they are using a GoHenry or something like that, you can look back at their spending pattern. Okay, there's a bit of a pattern here on Xbox credit spending. You know, why don't we put a limit on that? Or, you know, you seem to be spending an awful lot of money at the paper shop buying sweets. <laughs> Let's think about your teeth and, you know, maybe sort of put a limit on that. Or, you know, you're actually racking up quite a big bit of savings here. What 
might you want to spend it on? A new bike or, you know, some new trainers or whatever. And then making a real big event of them spending their own money that they've saved. You know, these are really positive reinforcements that we can do quite easily, really. But again, we just need to be intentional about it and and sit down and, and make it happen rather than just kind of hope everything will be okay. I love the way you've brought in the technology with the phone because, as you say, everybody, particularly young kids now, are living on their phone. So if they can see, okay, I can see what's in my bank or what money I've earned, what's gone out because this is what I've spent. I mean, that's how they live their life is everything is on the phone. It is, and that ain't going to change. A lot of sort of folks my age have this sort of uh, existential angst about how much time the kids are spending on their phone. It's like, well, it's going to happen, so just teach them. You know, I mean, don't let them be on the phone on the dinner table or after you know make sure they put it down an hour before they go to bed there's also some pretty well documented advantages of of limiting how much time they spend but it's lunacy to me i think to force kids to think in coins and notes when the world that they are growing up in is entirely digital so it's just a case of how do we reinforce the same good lessons that you had but Mm -hmm. in a digital virtual world it's not that it's not that hard you know, plenty of adults are actually pretty worried about technology and things like that. But, you know, you're just going to have to man up and, uh, and embrace it. I'm afraid there's no way around it. And actually to try and avoid doing this stuff online and in a digital way will, I think, hamper our kids. Uh, we need to, rather than try to limit too much what they do online, we need to teach them how to do it safely and healthily. I think that's a very valuable lesson for us as an adult as well, because more of our banking is being done on the phone. You know, if you're doing something online, you'll get a security pin number sent to your phone to complete the transaction. And I also remember many, many years ago, Pete, you were talking about, and you've covered it briefly here, you sit down with Joanne once a month and just go through, okay, what's in the bank? What have we got coming up? What have we got a budget with? And I remember that podcast, and that went out years and years and years ago. From that, Pete and I, my husband, we sit down once a week, generally for about 10 minutes, and say, okay, what's in the bank? What have we got coming up this month? Anything we we need to do financially? And yes, it was a pain at first. There was a few sort of moans and groans. But now it's okay, right, I'm ready. I've got all my paperwork, got my figures. That 10 minutes, sit down with a cup of coffee. And yeah. we, we were both on the same page. Yeah. We know what's occurring. And okay, because one of my values is financial security. Knowing my bills are paid, I can sleep well at night. I don't know anybody, any money. You know, yeah. I've got the money for the bills coming in. For me, it's, it's one of my values, absolutely. Uh, being on the same page... It is so important. It's just because it it kind of releases a, a mental anxiety, which might actually be subconscious. Money has real power to do that. It can uh, really influence our mental health. The temptation is to avoid it, thinking if we don't deal with it, then I don't have to think about it. I won't feel bad about it. But actually, that's, that's counterproductive, of course, like anything. Yeah, it takes a bit of bravery sometimes, but we've got to face up to it and make a point of dealing with what we need to deal with. And in so doing, it's incredibly freeing. And having good, healthy conversations with our life partner, uh, if we're sharing our lives with them, there's going to be some overlap in finances to a greater or lesser extent. Every couple, every family is different. But just sitting down and doing that is uh, very powerful and very good for the relationship and good for your financial health as well, for sure. One thing I just wanted to cover with you, Pete, you've always said over the years, remember, there are only three valid uses for money. Mm -hmm. Spending, investing for the future, and giving away. It's, yeah, I mean, it ain't rocket science, but it's, the the thing with money is to keep it in its place. It's become a god, and, but actually, money is, it's a great servant, but a lousy master, right? So if we can keep money in its place, i.e. we have control of it, we tell it what we want it to do, as opposed to getting ourselves in a position where we're just longing for the next payday. And when it comes, you know, we'll be able to pay our overdraft off, but then we're back to zero. 
and then we just go down again. And that just continual anxiety over that. If we can keep it in its place and really master it, then, man, that's, that is a, a really free way to live. And keeping it in its place is, is remembering those, those three things, right? So I, I'm the first, I spend a lot of my time telling my clients to spend their own money, right? It's a really fun way to use money because you've got to have it, spend it, right? Don't spend other people's money by borrowing it. That doesn't make uh, any sense at all. But obviously, my clients tend to be retired, fairly wealthy, and I actually have to work quite hard with them to get them to enjoy the fruits of their good discipline over the years. It's like, for God's sake, spend it, right? You don't want to die rich. You know, yes, help your kids, do all the stuff you want to do with it, but, you know, uh, enjoy it yourself as well. Buy the nice car. Take the nice holiday. That's fine. And I help them plan that they can do that efficiently. So spending it is a great way to enjoy it. Investing in the future is inevitable. You know, we, well, it should be inevitable. We're all of us get to the point where we're going to be too knackered or we don't want to work anymore. <laughs> so we'll need to have something behind us that we can draw down from, uh, you know, or the pensions or whatever. So obviously that's a large part of what I do as well. But I think the highest calling for, uh, for money is to spread it around. Uh, so that could be to our own family, it could be charities and causes that we care about. But that's even more, in fact, it's significantly more satisfying than just spending it on ourselves. Because I think we all of us get to a point where we've kind of got what we need. You, you know, we're not sort of lust after the next and the greatest and all that sort of stuff. We've kind of got what we need. And so what do you do with it then? Well, let's try and help some other people. Let's, let's help our kids get on the property ladder, stuff like that. So I think if you remember those things, the only three valid uses of money, spend, invest for the future, give away. It keeps money in its place uh, because those are those are valid jobs. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it isn't rocket science. It's just, you know, as I've worked with clients over 20 years and gone on my own, everybody goes on journeys these days, don't they? But I've gone on my own journey, you know, my own financial journey of learning how to manage it myself. Um, those are really just useful guidelines. And as you sit down, whether it's with your kids, <laughs> you know, with the pots, spend, save, give away, or whether it's your own budget, how much are we going to spend, how much are we going to save, all that sort of stuff. Keeping those three things in mind just puts constraints on money. And like any good, you know, game of football or rugby or whatever, you know, you need rules, you need those constraints for it to be a, a productive and, and healthy thing. And that's the same with money, I think. I mean, Pete, the topic of this podcast was financial education for children, but the information and advice and the common sense you have given is for everybody. Well, thank you. Bless you. Very kind. Yeah, it is. And that, that's actually what I love about it. <laughs> People say you're never going to run out of stuff to talk about. You know, I'm doing the podcast for nine years. I've been doing YouTube videos for 11 years. Are you ever going to run out of stuff to talk about? Well, it's basically the same stuff, just sliced up and diced up different ways. So whether it's for kids or whether it's for people at the end of their lives or the cusp of retirement, it's the same lessons. The mechanics might change slightly, but it's basically the same lessons, um, which is great because it means it's actually easy to learn. Money is actually fairly easy to understand. It's uh, not necessarily, well, I should say it's simple to understand. It's not always easy to implement. I realize everybody's got their own pressures and difficulties. But actually, the, the rules are simple and they are universal, which is, which is good because it means you haven't got to relearn them as you go through life, which is why it's so important to get it right with our kids early on. Pete, it's been absolutely brilliant. I think you've done a great job educa you. educating us about educating kids. <laughs> you've talked to us about what money is for, you know, spend it, et cetera, enjoy your money. I love the idea of, you know, maybe having something on the fridge that the kids can colour in if, if the family's saving towards a holiday or something, make it visual. Yeah, you are a superstar oh, with you. money. Well, you're very kind. I really appreciate all your encouragement over the years, <laughs> Sheila, and uh, I really appreciate you inviting me on. It's been a blast. Thank you so much. Well, most of my financial edu education, I think you took over from where my parents left off. And between you, you've kept me on the straight and narrow, which I very much appreciate. Pete, thank you so much for all your time. And I'll put all the links to your podcast, YouTube, book and everything. So, Pete, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Sheila. It's been a blast. You're welcome. I hope you have enjoyed the conversation. Don't forget, if you have a story you would like to tell, please get in touch. 
My email address is allaboutyoupodcast at yahoo.com and thank you for listening.